Section 7 of Victorian Short Stories Tales of Courtship. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Victorian Short Stories Tales of Courtship by Hubert Crackenthorpe et al. The Woman Beater by Israel Zangwill. From the Grey Wig Stories and Novelettes, New York, The Macmillan Company, 1903. Part 1. She came to meet John Le Foll, but John Le Foll did not know he was to meet Winifred Glamoris. He did not even know he was himself the meeting point of all the brilliant and beautiful persons assembled in the publisher's Saturday salon, for although a youthful minor poet, he was modest and lovable. Perhaps his Oxford tutorship was sobering. At any rate, his head remained unturned by his precocious fame, and to meet these other young men and women, his reverend seniors on the slopes of Parnassus, gave him more pleasure than the receipt of royalties. Not that his publisher afforded him much opportunity of contrasting the two pleasures the profits of the muse went to provide his room of old furniture and roses this beautiful garden a-twinkle with japanese lanterns like gorgeous fire-flowers blossoming under the white crescent moon of early june winifred glamorous was not literary herself she was better than a poetess she was a poem the publisher always threw in a few realities, and some beautiful brainless creature would generally be found the nucleus of a crowd, while Cleo, in spectacles, languished in a corner. Winifred Glamoris, however, was reputed to have a tongue that matched her eye, paralleling with whimsies and epigrams, its freakish fires and witcheries, and, assuredly, flitting in her white gown through the dark, balmy garden, she seemed the very spirit of moonlight the subtle incarnation of night and roses when john le foll met her cecilia was with her and the first conversation was triangular cecilia fired most of the shots she was a bouncing rattling beauty chock full of confidence and high spirits except when asked to do the one thing she could do sing then she became quite genuinely a nervous hesitant pale little thing however the suppliant hostess bore her off and presently her rich contralto notes passed through the garden adding to its passion and mystery and through the open french windows john could see her standing against the wall near the piano her head thrown back her eyes half closed her creamy throat swelling in the very abandonment of artistic ecstasy what a charming creature he exclaimed involuntarily that is what everybody thinks except her husband winifred laughed is he blind then asked john with his cloistral naivety blind no love is blind marriage is never blind the bitterness in her tone pierced john he felt vaguely the passing of some icy current from unknown seas of experience cecilia's voice soared out enchantingly then marriage must be deaf he said or such music as that would charm it she smiled sadly her smile was the tricksy play of moonlight among clouds of fairy you have never been married she said simply do you mean that you too are neglected something impelled him to exclaim worse she murmured it is incredible he cried you hush my husband will hear you her warning whisper brought him into a delicious conspiracy with her which is your husband he whispered back there near the casement standing gazing open-mouthed at cecilia he always opens his mouth when she sings it is like two toys moved by the same wire he looked at the tall stalwart ruddy-haired anglo-saxon do you mean to say he i mean to say nothing but you said i said worse why what can be worse she put her hand over her face i am ashamed to tell you 
how adorable was that half divined blush but you must tell me everything he scarcely knew how he had leapt into this role of confessor he only felt they were moved by the same wire her head drooped on her breast he beats me what john forgot to whisper it was the greatest shock his recluse life had known compact as it was of horror at the revelation shamed confusion at her candour and delicious pleasure in her confidence this fragile exquisite creature under the rod of a brutal bully once he had gone to a wedding reception and among the serious presence some grinning philistine drew his attention to an uncouth club a wife-beater he called it the flippancy had jarred upon john terribly this intrusive reminder of the customs of the slums it grated like billingsgate in a boudoir now that savage weapon recurred to him for a lurid instant he saw winifred's husband wielding it oh abomination of his sex and did he stand there in his immaculate evening dress posing as an english gentleman even so might some gentleman burglar bear through a salon his imper imperturbable swallow-tail beat a woman beat that essence of charm and purity god's best gift to man redeeming him from his own grossness could such things be john lefol would as soon have credited the french legend that english wives are sold in smithfield no it could not be real that this flower-like figure was thrashed do you mean to say he cried the rapidity of her confidence alone made him feel it all of a dreamlike unreality hush cecilia's singing she admonished him with an unexpected smile as her fingers fell from her face oh you have been making fun of me he was vastly relieved he beats you at chess or at lawn tennis does one wear a high-necked dress to conceal the traces of chess or lawn tennis he had not noticed her dress before save for its spiritual whiteness susceptible though he was to beautiful shoulders winifred's enchanting face had been sufficiently distracting now the thought of physical bruises gave him a second spasm of righteous horror that delicate rose-leaf flesh abraded and lacerated the ruffian does he use a stick or a fist both but as a rule he just takes me by the arms and shakes me like a terrier a rat i'm all black and blue now poor butterfly he murmured poetically why did i tell you she murmured back with subtler poetry the poet thrilled in every vein love at first sight of which he had often read and often written was then a reality it could be as mutual too as romeo's and juliet's but how awkward that juliet should be married and her husband a bill sykes in broadcloth part two mrs glamorous herself gave at homes every sunday afternoon and so on the morrow after a sleepless night mitigated by perpended sonnets the love-sick young tutor presented himself by invitation at the beautiful old house in hampstead he was enchanted to find his heart's mistress set in an eighteenth-century frame of small-paned windows and of high oak panelling and at once began to image her dancing minuets and playing on virginals her husband was absent but a broad band of velvet round winifred's neck was a painful reminder of his possibilities winifred however said it was only a touch of sore throat caught in the garden her eyes added that there was nothing in the pathological dictionary which she would not willingly have caught for the sake of those divine if draughty moments but that alas it was more than a mere bodily ailment she had caught there there were a great many visitors in the two delightfully quaint rooms among whom he wandered disconsolate and admired jealous of her scattered smiles but presently he found himself seated by her side in a cosy corner near the open folding doors with all the other guests huddled round a violinist in the inner room how winifred had managed it he did not know but she sat plausibly in the outer room awaiting newcomers 
and this particular niche was invisible save to a determined eye he took her unresisting hand that dear warm hand with its begemmed artistic fingers and held it in uneasy beatitude how wonderful she the beautiful and adored hostess of whose sweetness and charm he heard even her own guests murmur to one another it was her actual flesh and blood hand that lay in his thrillingly tangible oh adventure beyond all merit beyond all hoping but every now and then the outer door facing them would open on some newcomer and john had hastily to release her soft magnetic fingers and sit demure and jealously overhear her effusive welcome to those innocent intruders nor did his brow clear till she had shepherded them within the inner fold fortunately the refreshments were in this section so that once therein few of the sheep strayed back and the jiggling wail of the violin was succeeded by a shrill babble of tongues and the clatter of cups and spoons get me an ice please strawberry she ordered john during one of these forced intervals in manual flirtation and when he had steered laboriously to and fro he found a young actor beside her in his cosy corner and his jealous fancy almost saw their hands dispart he stood over them with a sickly smile while winifred ate her ice when he returned from depositing the empty saucer the player fellow was gone and in remorse for his mad suspicion he stooped and reverently lifted her fragrant finger-tips to his lips the door behind his back opened abruptly good-bye she said rising in a flash the words had the calm conventional cadence and instantly extorted from him amid all his dazedness the corresponding good-bye when he turned and saw it was mr glamorous who had come in his heart leapt wildly at the nearness of his escape as he passed this masked ruffian he nodded perfunctorily and received a cordial smile yes he was handsome and fascinating enough externally this blond savage a man may smile and smile and be a villain john thought I wonder how he'd feel if he knew I knew he beats women. He lingered purposely in the hall to get an impression of the brute, who had begun talking loudly to a friend with irritating bursts of laughter, speciously frank ringing. Golf, fishing, comic operas, ah, the Boeotian. These were the men who monopolized the ethereal divinities but this brusque separation from his particular divinity was disconcerting how to see her again he must go up to oxford in the morning he wrote her that night but if she could possibly let him call during the week he would manage to run down again oh my dear dreaming poet she wrote to oxford how could you possibly send me a letter to be laid on the breakfast-table beside the times with a poem in it too Fortunately, my husband was in a hurry to get down to the city, and he neglected to read my correspondence. The unchivalrous blackguard, John commented, but what can you expect of a woman-beater? Never, never write to me again at the house. A letter, care of Mrs. Best, 8A Foley Street, West City, will always find me. She is my maid's mother, and you must not come here either my dear handsome head in the clouds except to my at-homes and then only at judicious intervals i shall be walking round the pond in kensington gardens at four next wednesday unless mrs best brings me a letter to the contrary and now thank you for your delicious poem i do not recognize my humble self in the dainty lines but i shall always be proud to think i inspired them will it be in the new volume I have never been in print before. It will be a novel sensation. I cannot pay you song for song, only feeling for feeling. Oh, John Le Foll, why did we not meet when I had still my girlish dreams? Now I have grown to distrust all men, to fear the brute beneath the cavalier. Mrs. Best did bring her a letter, but it was not to cancel the appointment only to say he was not surprised at her horror of the male sex but that she must beware of false generalizations 
life was still a wonderful and beautiful thing vide poem enclosed he was counting the minutes till wednesday afternoon it was surely a popular mistake that only sixty went into the hour this chronometrical reflection recurred to him even more poignantly in the hour that he circumambulated the pond in kensington gardens had she forgotten had her husband locked her up what could have happened it seemed six hundred minutes ere at half-past five she came tripping daintily towards him his brain had been reduced to insanely devising problems for his pupils if a man walks two strides of one and a half feet a second round a lake fifty acres in area in how many turns will he overtake a lady who walks half as fast and isn't there but the moment her pink parasol loomed on the horizon all his long misery vanished in an ineffable peace and uplifting he hurried bareheaded to clasp her little gloved hand he had forgotten her unpunctuality nor did she remind him of it how sweet of you to come all that way was all she said and it was a sufficient reward for the hours in the train and the six hundred minutes among the nursemaids and perambulators the elms were in their glory the birds were singing briskly the water sparkled the sunlit sward stretched fresh and green it was the loveliest coolest moment of the afternoon john instinctively turned down a leafy avenue nature and love what more could poet ask no we can't have tea by the kiosk mrs glamouris protested of course i love anything that savours of paris but it's become so fashionable there will be heaps of people who know me i suppose you've forgotten it's the height of the season i know a quiet little place in the high street she led him unresisting but bemused towards the gate and into a confectioner's conversation languished on the way tea he was about to instruct the pretty attendant strawberry ices mrs glamouris remarked gently and some of those nice french cakes the ice restored his spirits it was really delicious and he had got so hot and tired pacing round the pond decidedly winifred was a practical person and he was a dreamer the pastry he dared not touch being a genius but he was charmed at the gaiety with which winifred crammed cake after cake into her rosebud of a mouth what an enchanting creature how bravely she covered up her life's tragedy the thought made him glance at her velvet band it was broader than ever he has beaten you again he murmured furiously her joyous eyes saddened she hung her head and her fingers crumbled the cake what is his pretext he asked his blood burning jealousy she whispered his blood lost its glow ran cold he felt the bully's blows on his own skin his romance turning suddenly sordid but he recovered his courage he too had muscles but i thought he just missed seeing me kiss your hand she opened her eyes wide it wasn't you you darling old dreamer he was relieved and disturbed in one somebody else he murmured somehow the vision of the player fellow came up she nodded isn't it lucky he has himself drawn a red herring across the track i didn't mind his blows you were safe then with one of her adorable transitions i am dreaming of another ice she cried with roguish wistfulness i was afraid to confess my own greediness he said laughing he beckoned the waitress two more we haven't got any more strawberries was her unexpected reply there's been such a run on them to-day winifred's face grew overcast oh nonsense she pouted to john the moment seemed tragic won't you have another kind he queried he himself liked any kind but he could scarcely eat a second ice without her winifred meditated coffee she queried the waitress went away and returned with a face as gloomy as winifred's it's been such a hot day she said deprecatingly there is only one ice in the place and that's neapolitan well bring two neapolitans john ventured 
I mean there is only one Neapolitan ice left. Well, bring that. I don't really want one. He watched Mrs. Glamorris daintily devouring the solitary ice, and felt a certain pathos about the party-coloured oblong, a something of the haunting sadness of the last rose of summer. It would make a graceful, serio-comic triolette, he was thinking. But at the last spoonful, his beautiful companion dislocated his rhymes by her sudden upspringing. "'Goodness gracious!' she cried. "'How late it is!' "'Oh, you are not leaving me yet,' he said. A world of things sprang to his brain, things that he was going to say, to arrange. They had said nothing, not a word of their love even, nothing but cakes and ices.' poet she laughed have you forgotten i live at hampstead she picked up her parasol put me into a hansom or my husband will be raving at his lonely dinner table he was so dazed as to be surprised when the waitress blocked his departure with a bill when winifred was spirited away he remembered she might without much risk have given him a lift to paddington he hailed another hansom and caught the next train to oxford but he was too late for his own dinner in hall part three he was kept very busy for the next few days and could only exchange a passionate letter or two with her for some time the examination fever had been raging and in every college poor patients sat with wet towels round their heads some who had neglected their tutor all the term now strove to absorb his omniscience in a sitting on the Monday, John Lefolle was good-naturedly giving a special audience to a muscular dunce, trying to explain to him the political effects of the Crusades, when there was a knock at the sitting-room door, and the scout ushered in Mrs. Glamorris. She was bewitchingly dressed in white, and stood in the open doorway, smiling, an embodiment of the summer he was neglecting. He rose, but his tongue was paralysed. The dunce became suddenly important, a symbol of the decorum he had been outraging his soul torn so abruptly from history to romance could not get up the right emotion why this imprudence of winifred's she had been so careful heretofore what a lot of boots there are on your staircase she said gaily he laughed the spell was broken yes the heap to be cleaned is rather obtrusive he said but i suppose it is a sort of tradition "'I think I've got a hold of the thing pretty well now, sir,' the dunce rose and smiled, and his tutor realised how little the dunce had to learn in some things. He felt quite grateful to him. "'Oh, well, you'll come and see me again after lunch, won't you, if one or two points occur to you for elucidation,' he said, feeling vaguely a liar, and generally guilty. But when, on the departure of the dunce, Winifred held out her arms, everything fell from him, but the sense of the exquisite moment their lips met for the first time but only for an instant he had scarcely time to realize that this wonderful thing had happened before the mobile creature had darted to his bookshelves and was examining a thucydides upside down how clever to know greek she exclaimed and do you really talk it with the other dons no we never talk shop he laughed but winifred what made you come here i had never seen oxford isn't it beautiful there's nothing beautiful here he said looking round his sober study no she admitted there's nothing i care for here and had left another celestial kiss on his lips before he knew it and now you must take me to lunch and on the river he stammered i have work she pouted but i can't stay beyond to-morrow morning and i want so much to see all your celebrated oarsmen practising you are not staying over the night he gasped yes i am and she threw him a dazzling glance his heart went pitter-pat where he murmured oh some poky little hotel near the station the swell hotels are full he was glad to hear she was not conspicuously quartered so many people have come down already for Kamen, he said. I suppose they are anxious to see the generals get their degrees. But hadn't we better go somewhere and lunch? They went down the stone staircase, past the battalion of boots, and across the quad. 
he felt that all the windows were alive with eyes but she insisted on standing still and admiring their ivied picturesqueness after lunch he shamefacedly borrowed the dunce's punt the necessities of punting which kept him far from her and demanded much adroit labour gradually restored his self-respect and he was able to look the uncelebrated oarsmen they met in the eyes except when they were accompanied by their parents and sisters which subtly made him feel uncomfortable again but winifred piquant under her pink parasol was singularly at ease enraptured with the changing beauty of the river applauding with childish glee the wild flowers on the banks or the rippling reflections in the water look look she cried once pointing skyward he stared upwards expecting a balloon at least but it was only keats's little rosy cloud she explained it was not her fault if he did not find the excursion unreservedly idyllic how stupid she reflected to keep all those nice boys cooped up reading dead languages in a spot made for life and love i'm afraid they don't disturb the dead languages so much as you think he reassured her smiling and there will be plenty of love-making during Kamem. i am so glad i suppose there are lots of engagements that week oh yes but not one per cent come to anything really oh how fickle men are that seemed rather question-begging but he was so thrilled by the implicit revelation that she could not even imagine feminine inconstancy that he forbore to draw her attention to her inadequate logic so childish and thoughtless indeed was she that day that nothing would content her but attending a viva which he had incautiously informed her was public nobody will notice us she urged with strange unconsciousness of her loveliness besides they don't know i'm not your sister the oxford intellect is sceptical he said laughing it cultivates philosophical doubt but putting a bold face on the matter and assuming a fraternal air he took her to the torture chamber in which candidates sat dolefully in a row of chairs against the wall waiting their turn to come before the three grand inquisitors at the table fortunately winifred and he were the only spectators but unfortunately they blundered in at the very moment when the poor owner of the punt was on the rack the central inquisitor was trying to extract from him information about becket almost prompting him with the very words but without penetrating through the duncical denseness john le Foll breathed more freely when the crusades were broached but alas it very soon became evident that the dunce had by no means got hold of the thing as the dunce passed out sadly obviously ploughed john le Foll suffered more than he so conscience-stricken was he that when he had accompanied winifred as far as her hotel he refused her invitation to come in pleading the compulsoriness of duty and dinner in hall but he could not get away without promising to call in during the evening the prospect of this visit was with him all through dinner at once tempting and terrifying assuredly there was a skeleton at his feast as he sat at the high table facing the master the venerable portraits round the hall seemed to rebuke his romantic waywardness in the common room he sipped his port uneasily listening as in a daze to the discussion on free will which an eminent stranger had stirred up how academic it seemed compared with the passionate realities of life but somehow he found himself lingering on at the academic discussion postponing the realities of life every now and again he was impelled to glance at his watch but suddenly murmuring it is very late he pulled himself together and took leave of his learned brethren but in the street the sight of a telegraph office drew his steps to it and almost mechanically he wrote out the message regret detained will call early in morning when he did call in the morning he was told she had gone back to london the night before on receipt of a telegram he turned away with a bitter pang of disappointment and regret part four their subsequent correspondence was only the more amorous the reason she had fled from the hotel she explained was that she could not endure the night in those stuffy quarters he consoled himself with the hope of seeing much of her 
during the long vacation he did see her once at her own reception but this time her husband wandered about the two rooms the cosy corner was impossible and they could only manage to gasp out a few mutual endearments amid the buzz and movement and to arrange a rendezvous for the end of july when the day came he received a heartbroken letter stating that her husband had borne her away to goodwood in a postscript she informed him that quicksilver was a sure thing much correspondence passed without another meeting being effected and he lent her five pounds to pay a debt of honour incurred through her husband's absurd confidence in quicksilver a week later this horsey husband of hers brought her to brighton for the races there and hither john le Fol flew but her husband shadowed her and he could only lift his hat to her as they passed each other on the lawns sometimes he saw her sitting pensively on a chair while her lord and thrasher perused a pink sporting paper such tantalizing proximity raised their correspondence through the hove post office to fever heat life apart they felt was impossible and removed from the sobering influences of his cap and gown john le Foll dreamed of throwing everything to the winds his literary reputation had opened out a new career the winifred lyrics alone had brought in a tidy sum and though he had expended that and more on dispatches of flowers and trifles to her yet he felt this extravagance would become extinguished under daily companionship and the poems provoked by her charms would go far towards their daily maintenance yes he could throw up the university he would rescue her from this bully this gentleman bruiser they would live openly and nobly in the world's eye a poet was not even expected to be conventional she on her side was no less ardent for the great step she raged against the world's law the injustice by which her husband's cruelty was not sufficient ground for divorce but we finer souls must take the law into our own hands she wrote we must teach society that the ethics of a barbarous age are unfitted for our century of enlightenment but somehow the actual time and place of the elopement could never get itself fixed in september her husband dragged her to scotland in october after the pheasants when the dramatic day was actually fixed winifred wrote by the next post deferring it for a week even the few actual preliminary meetings they planned for kensington gardens or hampstead heath rarely came off he lived in a whirling atmosphere of express letters of excuse and telegrams that transformed the situation from hour to hour not that her passion in any way abated or her romantic resolution really altered it was only that her conception of time and place and ways and means was dizzily mutable but after nigh six months of palpitating negotiations with the adorable mrs glamoris the poet in a moment of dejection penned the prose apothem it is of no use trying to change a changeable person part five but at last she astonished him by a sketch plan of the elopement so detailed even to bandboxes and the paris night route by a dieppe that no further room for doubt was left in his intoxicated soul and he was actually further astonished when just as he was putting his handbag into the hansom a telegraph was handed to him saying gone to homburg letter follows he stood still for a moment on the pavement in utter distraction what did it mean had she failed him again or was it simply that she had changed the city of refuge from paris to homburg he was about to name the new station to the cabman but then letter follows surely that meant that he was to wait for it perplexed and miserable he stood with the telegram crumpled up in his fist what a ridiculous situation he had wrought himself up to the point of breaking with the world and his past and now it only remained to satisfy the cabman he tossed feverishly all night seeking to soothe himself but really exciting himself the more by a hundred plausible explanations he was now strung up to such a pitch of uncertainty that he was astonished for the third time when the letter did duly follow dearest it ran as i explained in my telegram my husband became suddenly ill 
if she had only put that in the telegram he groaned and was ordered to homburg of course it was impossible to leave him in this crisis both for practical and sentimental reasons you yourself darling would not like me to have aggravated his illness by my flight just at this moment and thus possibly have his death on my conscience darling you are always right he said kissing the letter let us possess our souls in patience a little longer i need not tell you how vexatious it will be to find myself nursing him in homburg out of the season even instead of the prospect to which i had looked forward with my whole heart and soul but what can one do how true is the french proverb nothing happens but the unexpected write to me immediately post restante that i may at least console myself with your dear words the unexpected did indeed happen despite draught of elizabeth brennan and promenades on the courthouse terrace the stalwart woman beater succumbed to his malady the curt telegram from winifred gave no indication of her emotions he sent a reply telegram of sympathy with her trouble although he could not pretend to grieve at this sudden providential solution of their life problem still he did sincerely sympathize with the distress inevitable in connection with a death especially on foreign soil he was not able to see her till her husband's body had been brought across the north sea and committed to the green repose of the old hampstead churchyard he found her pathetically altered her face wan and spiritualized and all in subtle harmony with the exquisite black gown in the first interview he did not dare speak of their love at all they discussed the immortality of the soul and she quoted george herbert but with the weeks the question of their future began to force its way back to his lips we could not decently marry before six months she said when definitely confronted with the problem six months he gasped well surely you don't want to outrage everybody she said pouting at first he was outraged himself what she who had been ready to flutter the world with a fantastic dance was now measuring her footsteps but on reflection he saw that mrs glamorys was right once more since providence had been good enough to rescue them why should they fly in its face a little patience and a blameless happiness lay before them let him not blind himself to the immense relief he really felt at being spared social obloquy after all a poet could be unconventional in his work he had no need of the practical outlet demanded for the less gifted part six they scarcely met at all during the next six months it had naturally in this grateful reaction against their recklessness become a sacred period even more charged with tremulous emotion than the engagement periods of those who have not so nearly scorched themselves even in her presence he found a certain pleasure in combining distant adoration with the confident expectation of proximity and thus she was restored to the sanctity which she had risked by her former easiness and so all was for the best in the best of all possible worlds when the six months had gone by he came to claim her hand she was quite astonished you promised to marry me at the end of six months he reminded her surely it isn't six months already she said he referred her to the calendar recalled the date of her husband's death you are strangely literal for a poet she said of course i said six months but six months doesn't mean twenty-six weeks by the clock all i meant was that a decent period must intervene but even to myself it seems only yesterday that poor harold was walking beside me in the courthouse park she burst into tears and in the face of them he could not pursue the argument gradually after several interviews and letters it was agreed that they should wait another six months she is right he reflected again we have waited so long we may as well wait a little longer and leave malice no handle the second six months seemed to him much longer than the first the charm of respectful adoration had lost its novelty and once again his breast was racked by fitful fevers which could scarcely calm themselves even by conversion into sonnets the one point of repose was that shining thick star of marriage 
still smarting under winifred's reproach of his unpoetic literality he did not intend to force her to marry him exactly at the end of the twelve month but he was determined that she should have no later than this exact date for at least naming the day not the most punctilious stickler for convention he felt could deny that mrs grundy's claim had been paid to the last minute the publication of his new volume containing the winifred lyrics had served to colour these months of intolerable delay even the reaction of the critics against the poetry that conventional revolt against every second volume that parrot cry of overpraise from the very throats that had praised him though it pained and perplexed him was perhaps really helpful at any rate the long waiting was over at last he felt like jacob after his years of service for rachel the fateful morning dawned bright and blue and as the towers of oxford were left behind him he recalled that distant saturday when he had first gone down to meet the literary lights of london in his publisher's salon how much older he was now than then and yet how much younger the nebulous melancholy of youth the clouds of philosophy had vanished before this beautiful creature of sunshine whose radiance cut out a clear line for his future through the confusion of life at a florist's in the high street of hampstead he bought a costly bouquet of white flowers and walked airily to the house and rang the bell jubilantly he could scarcely believe his ears when the maid told him her mistress was not at home how dared the girl stare at him so impassively did she not know by what appointment on what errand he had come had he not written to her mistress a week ago that he would present himself that afternoon not at home he gasped but when will she be home i fancy she won't be long she went out about an hour ago she has an appointment with her dressmakers at five do you know in what direction she'd have gone oh generally she walks on the heath before tea the world suddenly grew rosy again i will come back again he said yes a walk in this glorious air heathward would do him good as the door shut he remembered he might have left the flowers but he would not ring again and besides it was perhaps better he should present them with his own hand than let her find them on the hall table still it seemed rather awkward to walk about the streets with a bouquet and he was glad accidentally to strike the old hampstead church and to seek a momentary seclusion in passing through its avenue of quiet gravestones on his heathward way mounting the few steps he paused idly a moment on the verge of this green god's acre to read a perpendicular slab on a wall and his face broadened into a smile as he followed the absurdly elaborate biography of a rich self-made merchant who had taught himself to read reader go thou and do likewise was the delicious bull at the end as he turned away the smile still lingering about his lips he saw a dainty figure tripping down the stony graveyard path and though he was somewhat startled to find her still in black there was no mistaking mrs glamorris she ran to meet him with a glad cry which filled his eyes with happy tears how good of you to remember she said as she took the bouquet from his unresisting hand and turned again on her footsteps he followed her wonderingly across the uneven road towards the narrow isle of graves on the left in another instant she had stooped before a shining white stone and laid his bouquet reverently upon it as he reached her side he saw that his flowers were almost lost in the vast mass of floral offerings with which the grave of the woman-beater was bestrewn how good of you to remember the anniversary she murmured again how could i forget it he stammered astonished is not this the end of the terrible twelve months the soft gratitude died out of her face oh is that what you were thinking of what else he murmured pale with conflicting emotions what else i think decency demanded that this day at least should be sacred to his memory oh what brutes men are and she burst into tears his patient breast revolted at last you said he was the brute he retorted outraged is that your chivalry to the dead oh my poor harold my poor harold for once her tears could not extinguish the flame of his anger 
"'But you told me he beat you,' he cried. "'And if he did, I dare say I deserved it. "'Oh, my darling, my darling!' "'She laid her face on the stone and sobbed. "'John Lafolle stood by in silent torture. "'As he helplessly watched her white throat swell and fall with the sobs, "'he was suddenly struck by the absence of the black velvet band, "'the truer mourning she had worn in the lifetime of the so lamented. "'A faint scar, only perceptible to his conscious eye, "'added to his painful bewilderment. "'At last she rose and walked unsteadily forward.' he followed her in mute misery in a moment or two they found themselves on the outskirts of the deserted heath how beautiful stretched the gorsy rolling country the sun was settling in great burning furrows of gold and green a panorama to take one's breath away the beauty and peace of nature passed into the poet's soul forgive me dearest he begged taking her hand she drew it away sharply i cannot forgive you you have shown yourself in your true colours her unreasonableness angered him again what do you mean i only came in accordance with our long-standing arrangement you have put me off long enough it is fortunate i did put you off long enough to discover what you are he gasped he thought of all the weary months of waiting all the long comedy of telegrams and express letters, the far-off flirtations of the cosy corner, the baffled elopement to Paris. Then you won't marry me? I cannot marry a man I neither love nor respect. You don't love me? Her spontaneous kiss in his sober Oxford study seemed to burn on his angry lips. No, I never loved you. He took her by the arms and turned her round roughly. "'Look me in the face and dare to say you have never loved me.' His memory was buzzing with passionate phrases from her endless letters. They stung like a swarm of bees. The sunset was like blood-red mist before his eyes. "'I have never loved you,' she said obstinately. His grasp on her arms tightened. He shook her. "'You are bruising me!' she cried. His grasp fell from her arms as though they were red-hot. He had become a woman beater. End of the Woman Beater by Israel Zangwill. End of Victorian Short Stories Tales of Courtship by Hubert Crackenthorpe et al.